Hello everyone, this is Shreyas here, your physics master teacher at Vedantu. And today we are going to revise the entire chapter of ray optics, which is very important for J, NEET as well as boards. So just before your examination or while you are preparing for this chapter or revising through the problems, make sure you put on your earphones and see this video again and again so you can brush up all the concepts as well as the formulas. So let's get started. And the first important thing that I want to talk about is the kinds of images. A real image is formed when the rays converge at a particular point like it's shown over here and it produces a crisp image on the screen. Yes, real images can be obtained on a screen like the one shown over here using some lenses or mirrors. Now the next kind of image that can be formed is a virtual image and a virtual image is formed when the rays appear to diverge from a particular point like the one shown over here. And the best example for that is observing an object using a magnifying glass. So you are on the other side and the image formed over here is virtual. You cannot touch it. It gives you just the feel as if it's there on the other side. Next, let's talk about reflection. Now the first law says that the incident ray and the reflected ray both make the same angles with the normal drawn to the reflecting surface. Not just that, the incident ray, the normal as well as the reflected ray, all of them are in the same plane. And remember, these laws are not just valid for plane mirrors, but also for any kind of curved or spherical mirrors. Now let's discuss the different properties of the images formed by a plane mirror. Like you can see over here, the image size and the object size are always the same. Not just that, the image and the object are equidistant from the mirror. Also remember that the image formed by a plane mirror is virtual. That means you cannot go behind the mirror and find the person behind you. Not just that, it's erect and it is laterally inverted. That means the left of the person is the right of the person inside the mirror. If you take a mirror and place it in the path of light, then the path of light gets deflected by a certain angle. Now that certain angle is called as the angle of deviation, which is the angle which the reflected ray makes with the incident ray. And that angle of deviation for a single surface is given by 180 degrees minus 2 theta. Now if you take a mirror and you rotate it by a certain angle theta, then the reflected ray rotates by twice the angle, which is 2 theta. And if you have two mirrors inclined at a certain angle theta, then the reflected ray's deviation with respect to the incident ray is independent of the angle of incidence. But in fact, it depends only on the angle between the two mirrors and the final deviation is given by 360 degrees minus 2 theta. If you take a mirror at rest and you take an object and move it towards the mirror, you will see that the image velocity is equal to the object velocity but with a negative sign because the directions are opposite. And all of this is with respect to the mirror. But if you keep the object at rest and move the mirror itself with a velocity of v, then you will find that the image will move with twice the velocity as that of the mirror. Now, you might have often visited a barber shop or a saloon where you find multiple images of yourself on either side. The reason why this happens is because your image formed by the reflection from the first mirror is going to be the object for the next reflection. And that image will be the object for the next reflection. And that's how you figure out all the images formed by multiple mirrors. Now that we have spoken about plane mirrors, let's talk about curved mirrors. Concave and convex mirrors are nothing but a part of a bigger spherical mirror. When you silver the outer surface, it becomes a concave mirror. And when you silver the inner surface, then it becomes a convex mirror. The center of the bigger sphere, which the mirror is a part of, is called as the center of curvature. And the radius of that bigger sphere is called as the radius of curvature. The pole is the center of that curved mirror. And the line which passes from the center and the pole is called as the principal axis. When you have parallel rays, which are incident on a concave mirror, they merge at a particular point. But in case of a convex mirror, these parallel rays appear to diverge from a particular point. That point is nothing but the focal point and is also known as the principal focus. The distance between the pole and the focal point is called as the focal length of that particular curved mirror. And the relationship with the radius of curvature is given by F is equal to R divided by 2. If you geometrically want to locate the exact position of the image, then you just need to follow some simple rules. Also remember, you just need two rays to locate the exact position of an image formed by a point object. Now the rule number one says that when you have a ray which passes through the center of curvature or appears to pass through the center of curvature, it retraces back the same path. 
the rule number two says that when you have a ray which is parallel to the principal axis then after the reflection it passes through the focus for a concave mirror or it appears to pass when extended through the focus for the convex mirror. Now the rule number three says when you have a ray which is incident on the pole then it reflects back symmetrically about the principal axis on the other side. If you want to find out the characteristics of the image formed as well as its location then you need to use the mirror formula which is 1 by f is equal to 1 by v plus 1 by u. v is the image distance, u is the object distance and the values have to be substituted with proper signs which you have already studied in your 10th grade. Now the image can also be magnified and the height of the image upon the height of the object is given by negative v by u. Now if this ratio comes out to be positive then the image is erect. If this ratio comes out to be negative then the image is inverted and if the magnitude of this magnification comes out to be more than one then the image is magnified and if the magnitude comes out to be less than one then the image is diminished. Also remember the image can be magnified along the principal axis and the width of the image upon the width of the object has the same ratio as that of the velocity of the image upon the velocity of the object. This can be used to solve the problems which involve motion of the object or the image. And remember the ratio is negative v square by u square. The last one is the power formula of the mirror and the power tells you the degree of convergence or the divergence produced by an optical instrument. If the power is positive then the optical device is converging and if it is negative then it is a diverging device. And the formula for a mirror is negative 1 by f. When light changes the medium then it also changes its speed and it also bends. This phenomena is called as refraction. Now when the light rays go from a rare medium like air to a denser medium like water then they bend towards the normal. But if they go from a dense medium like glass to rare medium like air then they bend away from the normal. Now the relationship between the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction is given by Snell's law mathematically and it states that sine of incident angle upon sine of refracted angle is constant for a given pair of medium and if the light goes from first medium to second medium it's denoted as 1 mu 2 and it's also called as the relative refractive index. Now remember this is pronounced as the refractive index of 2 with respect to 1 so that can be confusing at times. Also 1 mu 2 is speed of light in the first medium upon speed of light in the second medium. It's also equal to wavelength of light in the first medium upon the wavelength of light in the second medium. This is true because the frequency of light does not change. And also remember this is equal to absolute refractive index of medium 2 upon absolute refractive index of medium 1. When the light rays go from dense medium to rare medium, there is a chance that the light rays may not come out on the rarer side. In fact, there is an angle of incidence in the denser medium for which the refracted rays make 90 degrees with the normal or they come out parallel to the surface. That angle of incidence is called as the critical angle and for all angles of incidences inside the denser medium which are more than the critical angle the light rays do not emerge on the rarer side in fact they get totally internally reflected inside the denser medium. This is the concept behind the transmission of light in optical fibers. Now that we have spoken about plane surface refraction let's talk about refraction on the curved surfaces. Examples would be like the fossil preserved in an amber glass or watching through the meniscus of a fluid or watching those tiny mini objects placed inside a transparent paper weight. Now remember for every curved surface refraction Snell's law is obeyed at every point where refraction occurs. Now the mathematical way of locating the image is given by this formula which is mu2 by v minus mu1 by u is equal to mu2 minus mu1 by r where r is the radius of curvature and mu2 and mu1 are the refractive indices of the mediums where the refracted ray and the incident ray are present respectively. The magnification of the image is given by image height by object height which is equal to v mu1 divided by u mu2 and this can be remembered easily by remembering a cross over this formula like this v mu1 and u mu2. Refraction also leads us to believe that the pool is actually shallower than what it actually is. 
So if you are an observer outside the pool, you will find that the apparent depth is slightly lesser than the actual depth. And the apparent depth is the actual depth divided by mu, where mu is the relative refractive index. But if you are an observer inside the denser medium and you look outside, then you will find that the apparent height is taller than the actual height. And the apparent height is given by mu times of the actual height of the object. Now, this phenomena also leads to the apparent shift produced by the glass slab. So if you observe an object via a glass slab of certain thickness h, you will see that the image is formed slightly closer than the actual distance and that produces the apparent shift. And the formula for the apparent shift produced by the glass slab of thickness h is given by h into 1 minus 1 by mu, where mu is the refractive index of the glass slab. When you have two curved surfaces, it makes up a lens. In case of a convex lens, the rays which are parallel merge at a particular point. But in case of a concave lens, the rays appear to diverge from a particular point when placed in a rarer medium. Now the focal length is given by the lens maker formula, which is nothing but 1 by f is equal to mu minus 1 into 1 by r1 minus 1 by r2. R1 and R2 are the radii of curvature of those refracting surfaces and mu is always the relative refractive index. Just like you had rules for locating the nature and the location of the image in case of mirrors, similarly there are very simple rules in case of lenses as well. The first rule says that when you have rays which are parallel to the principal axis, then they meet at a particular point for a convex lens or they appear to diverge from a particular point in case of a concave lens. Now the second rule says that when you have a ray which passes through the pole, then it goes undeviated on the other side. And the third rule is when you have a ray which passes through the focal point or appears to pass through the focal point, then after the refraction, you will see that they will become parallel to the principal axis. This comes from the reversibility principle of light as well. Also, it's a very good practice to mark and draw all the kinds of images that will be formed by the object placed at different different locations and it's very important that you visualize this how the image nature changes or the magnification changes for a convex lens as well as for a concave lens it gives you a realistic feeling of what kind of images are formed by the ray diagram if you want to find the location and the nature of the image mathematically, that's when you use the lens formula, which is 1 by f is equal to 1 by v minus 1 by u, and v is the image distance, use the object distance with proper sign convention. Notice this formula is very similar to the mirror formula, just that there is no plus sign, instead there is a negative sign. In fact, the formula for magnification along the perpendicular direction of the principal axis is image height by object height, which is v by u notice the minus sign is missing over here and the formula for magnification along the principal axis that's given by v square by u square notice the minus sign which was there in the mirror formula is not there and it is nothing but the width of the image along the principal axis upon the width of the object along the principal axis and it is also same as the image velocity upon the object velocity again useful for solving motion related problems Similarly, you have the power formula. Notice again, the negative sign is missing in case of the lens and it's one by the focal length of the lens. Now, when you have more than one lenses combined together and both the lenses are thin, you can always combine them into one effective lens. And the power of the effective lens is just the simple addition of the power of the individual lenses. Hence, one upon the effective focal length is one upon f1 plus one upon f2, where f1 and f2 are the focal length of the individual lenses. In case of a lens which is silvered on one side, what you need to do is convert it by breaking it up into two lenses and one curved mirror. Now what happens is the refraction happens two times and the reflection happens once, hence the two lenses and the mirror. Now all of these three can be combined together into one single mirror because the rays which are falling onto the silvered lens effectively return back, so hence it behaves like a curved mirror. Now all you need to do is add the power of the lens and this lens and the power of this mirror, that will give you the power of the equivalent mirror. Now we all know the formula for converting power into focal length and that will help you solve the problem really easily. Now if you have loved this session and this video, do not forget to smash that like button out there and share it with your friends who are preparing for JEE 
NEET boards and all such competitive examinations and subscribe to our channel for more such videos. And if you want to know more about me, do not forget, you can also follow me on my Instagram handle that's Shreyas underscore Vedantu.